Cuban authorities advance in the operations to contain the fire at the Super Deep Hot Oil Tanks base in the city of Matanzas and thank international support. The governments of Colombia and Venezuela announced they are moving towards normalizing bilateral relations after three years of rupture. In Kenya, preliminary results of the general elections show a narrow victory for the presidential candidate William Ruto. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, in this are the news. While expressing gratitude to the international community for their support, Cuban authorities advance in operations to contain the fire at the Super Depot Oil Tanks base in the city of Matanzas. The Cuban authorities have praised the work of the teams of our fighters sent by Mexico and Venezuela, which together with the Cuban specialists have managed to keep the fire at bay. They also said that in the last hours, the water supply has been steady and containment dikes have been put up to prevent the spread of the flames. Meanwhile, supplies and the medicines for the care of the patients injured by the fire have arrived at the Faustino Perez Clinical Surgical Hospital in the city of Matanzas. This Wednesday, health authorities in Matanzas, Cuba, gave an update on the status of those injured in the accident of the Matanzas supertanker base. As of August 10th, 128 people received medical attention. Of them, 120 were men and seven women. After a few days hospitalized, 108 patients were discharged from their health care facilities. Up to Wednesday, five patients remain listed as critical, two as serious, and 13 as requiring care. Likewise, the Ministry of Public Health urged the population to stay informed through the official accounts of the ministry, as well as the daily reports of national television. We have some breaking news. On Wednesday, Paraguayan Senator Fernando Lugo suffered a cardiovascular stroke and is currently in an induced coma. According to local media reports and the testimonies of other fellow lawmakers, Lugo suffered the stroke while in his office in the Congress premises on Wednesday morning after having an abnormal high blood pressure episode. The former president, who survived lymphatic cancer while in the top post, is currently in the intensive care unit of the Migone Clinic under an induced coma, and his doctors say it was an ischemic stroke as a clot obstructs a blood vessel. This information is still preliminary as the events unfold. We move on to other topics. On the International Day of Indigenous Peoples, representatives of Mapuche communities insist on their call to all the Chileans to support a new constitution, which will go to a plebiscite in September. The proposal includes a set of rights for the indigenous peoples, such as territorial autonomy, self-government, and recognition of their own justice system. The bill was drafted by a 154-member democratically elected constitutional convention, of which 76 percent are either left or center. While the current ruling party is in favor of approving the text, the right and center-right position have rejected it. Zimena Yamin, councilwoman of the municipality of Pudael, who is also a spokesperson for the Mapuche community, said that if the new constitution is not approved, the one passed by the military dictatorship in 1981 will remain in force. We call on Chileans and First Nations to vote to approve. Chile is going through a historic and unprecedented period since October 18, 2019. We have to put an end to the constitution of the military junta. Peruvian police and the public prosecution agents raided the presidential palace in Lima in an oxen cell full bill to arrest Jennifer Paredes, the sister-in-law of President Pedro Castillo for alleged corruption and the money laundering. The unprecedented police operation was carried out after the prosecutor's office requested a raid of the presidential and the residential area of the government palace. After almost four hours of searching, the agents left the presidential residence without finding Paredes. Judicial raids also took place simultaneously in several other locations in the capital, with Jose Nenil Medina, Hugo, and Angie Espino arrested for alleged involvement in the same corruption reign. In a message broadcast on television, President Castillo 
Castillo denounced the operation, explaining it was a failed attempt from a group of members of the Congress, the Attorney General's office, and part of the press to remove him from office. Today, the government palace and the presidential house have once again been violated with an illegal raid endorsed by a judge. Coincidentally, when a request is being made for my disqualification for five years. Yesterday, before the Subcommission of Constitutional Accusations, a report was presented illegally requesting my disqualification and today putting on a media show. A public prosecutor's office raided my home in search of my sister-in-law, believing that with this they are going to break me. We're witnessing the continued implementation of a media plan aimed at an illegal and unconstitutional seizure of power. On Tuesday, the Bolivian Workers' Confederation denounced the destabilizing attempts by the groups in the Santa Cruz region. These groups call for demonstrations and the strikes in an attempt to postpone the population and housing census. Likewise, the Workers' Confederation demanded the government and the judiciary in the region take action against violent acts and described the strike as terrorism. The organization qualified this attitude as arrogance, discrimination and sedition. Meanwhile, the Confederation's executive Executive Secretary Juan Carlos Guarachi demanded the judiciary to give answers in a context where justice is still demanded the Sincaba and Sincara massacres. In this sense, he stressed that if there is no response from the Santa Cruz authorities, the workers will take over the Supreme Court of Justice of Chuquisaca. In Panama, the People United for Life Alliance reiterated the call for nationwide demonstrations and the street closures to demand that the government comply with the agreements reached at the single dialogue table. In response to the call, members of the Panamanian social and union organizations will mobilize on Wednesday in several regions of the country. The Teachers Associations of Panama, as a prof, announced that they will hold protests in each educational center and in the afternoon they will concentrate at the National Assembly. It is expected that the single dialogue table will be resumed on Thursday, August 11th, in Penonome, with the subject of the Social Security Fund and corruption. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. The governments of Colombia and Venezuela announced they are moving towards normalizing bilateral relations after three years of rupture. Colombian President Gustavo Petro said talks are underway and he expects to see results within two months. Venezuela's Minister of Defense for the National Armed Forces, Vladimir Padrino López, stated that President Nicolás Maduro Moros instructed him to re-establish military operations between the two countries, which share a travel border. Previously, foreign ministers of both nations met to begin the process of opening the border, where vehicle crossing has been restricted since 2015 and the closures worsened after the diplomatic rupture of 2019 with the outgoing administration of Iván Duque. I have been instructed by my Commander-in-Chief, President Nicolás Maduro, to contact the Colombian Defense Minister immediately, which I will do so in the next few hours. In the new national scenario that Colombia is experiencing, it is time to take up responsibilities and work together with responsibilities. On Tuesday, Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro Moros held a phone conversation with St. Kitts and Nevis Prime Minister-elect Terence Drew. On his official Twitter account, the Venezuelan president wrote, I had a phone conversation with Dr. Terence Drew, the Prime Minister-elect of St. Kitts and Nevis, to whom I expressed my congratulations for his victory last August the 5th. Venezuela reiterates its commitment to strengthen friendly relations with the peoples of the Caribbean.
In Mexico, hundreds of people held a festive march in the country's capital to celebrate International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. For the 13th consecutive year, members of native peoples, neighborhoods, and indigenous communities residing in Mexico City marched from the Glorieta de la Independencia to the capital's Zocalo Square, dressed in full colorful costumes for different regions of Mexico. The march was led by a banner with the slogan, Never Again in Mexico City Without Indigenous Peoples. For the first time, the march was accompanied by a group from the Afro-Mexican community. Mainly we are here to make the indigenous presence in Mexico City visible and that it is also understood that the indigenous cultures are part of a national culture and that we are proud to show in these days the different artistic and musical expressions. The U.S. government announced that it will end in a swift and orderly manner the policy that forces asylum seekers to wait in Mexico for justice to resolve their cases. The measure was announced on Monday by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security after a judge lifted a court order preventing Joe Biden from eliminating the Stay in Mexico protocol, which was put in place in 2019 by the former President Donald Trump. Since the policy began in January 2019, until Biden suspended it for the first time, more than 70,000 people were sent to Mexico, according to the American Immigration Council. The President of the United States, Joe Biden, enacted a multi-billion dollar bill that boosts the domestic manufacturing of semiconductors and other high-tech products. The initiative seeks to reverse the current global scenario in which only 10% of the world's supply is produced on the U.S. soil. The legislation provides $52.7 billion in funding to strengthen computer chip manufacturing and the supply chains. At the same time, it allocates more than $200 billion for scientific development in that field and budgets in favor of a creation of a workforce to boost the domestic industry through credits. With the law, Washington intends to become independent from the Chinese semiconductor supply chains, in addition to boosting its competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis Beijing and thus ensuring its leadership at the technological and scientific level. Now we address other topics. The global COVID-19 caseload has exceeded more than 500 million with the death toll, surpassing 6.41 million as of Tuesday, according to the latest data released by the World Health Organization. The United States has recorded more than 92.34 million confirmed COVID-19 cases nationwide, including over a million fatalities as of Wednesday, according to the Center for Disease and the System Science and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University. According to data from the WHO, the United States remains the country that has recorded the most confirmed coronavirus cases, followed by India and Brazil. Health officials attribute this recent surge in new cases to people letting their guard down and not following social distancing rules. Local governments in various countries have issued advisories urging people to wear face masks and follow COVID-19 protocols. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. In Kenya, preliminary results of the general elections show a narrow victory for the presidential candidate William Ruto.
According to data by electoral authorities, the current vice president, William Bruto, had reached 51.5% of the popular support, while his main opponent, the former prime minister and the leader of the coalition Hope for Unity, Raila Odinga, had obtained 47.85%. Of the more than 22 million citizens eligible to vote, close to 12 million exercised the right on Tuesday, a figure that represents more than 56% of the electoral roll. During the day, the citizens also elected senators, legislators, as well as women representatives, regional and local authorities. A catastrophic humanitarian crisis has gripped Afghanistan since the Taliban returned to power a year ago. The health care system is one of the most affected by the policies of the new government. Last month, the Musa Kuala District Hospital in Helmand province was forced to shut its doors to all except those suffering from suspected cholera. The population also lacks of basic sanitation needs like clean drinking water and an adequate sewage system. According to the United Nations, the current humanitarian crisis in the South Asian country is the world's worst. I hope the previous government returns so that we can have a good life and find food. We are exhausted. We are weak and facing a lot of problems. This sickness is here. There is no bliss in anything. Before it was better, since the Islamic Emirate is ruling, we can't find bread. I can't give milk to my children. We do not have anything. For the last three or four nights, we haven't had a proper warm meal. Before it was better, we could find things to eat. Now there is nothing. United States Secretary of State Anthony Blinken arrived in the Democratic Republic of Congo's capital, Kinshasa, continuing his three-nation tour of Africa. After his arrival at Njili International Airport, Blinken met with the President Felix Chikeri and members of the delegations of both countries. Over his two-day visit, the U.S. Secretary of State will meet with the government leaders and the civil society groups to discuss partnerships for regional security, human rights issues, environmental conservation, climate change, and bilateral trade and investment. Blinken is expected to encourage solutions to the violence in eastern Congo, where the attacks have increased dramatically in the past month with the resurgence of the M23 rebel group and others fighting for control of the mineral rich region. An air and sea rescue operation was underway on Wednesday after around 50 people went missing when a migrant boat sank in the agency. The vessel sank at dawn off the islands of Carpathos and Rhodes after setting sail on Tuesday from Antalya, southern Turkey, heading for Italy. According to a Coast Guard statement following information provided by the 29 rescued asylum seekers, there were 80 people on the boat, so up to 50 people are missing. The rescue effort, ordered by Mercant Shipping Minister Yanis Plakiotakis, including four vessels already sailing in the southern Asian, two Coast Guard patrol boats and a Greek Air Force helicopter. However, strong winds of up to 50 kilometers per hour were hampering the operation. 64 people have perished in the eastern Mediterranean since January, seen in the International Organization for Migration says. So we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.